we focus on, um, on the hippocampus, and in particular on CA1 pyramidal neurons, which provide the major output of the hippocampus. And CA1 pyramidal neurons are really extraordinary cells. They receive about 30,000 excitatory synaptic inputs from different brain regions. They have several thousand inhibitory synaptic inputs. And their job, basically, is to integrate all of this information, make a decision, and then generate an output. And so our lab has been really interested in trying to understand how the information from different brain regions converges on CA1, and what is the nature, Mark, of the computation that it might be playing with all of this information. And I'm sure, as many of you know, the major input pathway to the hippocampus um, and to CA1 comes from entorhinal cortex. And there are two major routes of information flow. One is an indirect pathway, where layer 2 stellate cells excite dentate gyrus granule cells, which excites CA3 pyramidal cells, which then send their axons to make excitatory synapses on the proximal dendrites near the soma of the CA1 pyramidal cell um, to fire action potentials. And this is called the trisynaptic path. And these axons are the Schaefer collateral axons from the CA3 neurons. And then CA1 sends output to a number of brain regions. A lot of it goes back to entorhinal cortex, forming this cortical hippocampal loop. And somehow, this, um, as you, I'm sure you all know, is critical for the formation of declarative memory, our memory of people, places, events, and things. And there's been a lot of work um, over the past um, oh, 30 or 40 years on the mechanisms, um, the cellular mechanism of memory storage, and really focusing on the ability of activity in each of these three synaptic pathways, high frequency stimulation activity, to lead to long lasting enhancements in synaptic transmission, giving us long term potentiation, or long lasting decreases in synaptic transmission, giving us long term depression. However, in addition to this indirect but powerful synaptic input to CA1, CA1 also receives a direct input from entorhinal cortex from layer 3 pyramidal neurons. And these target the very distal dendrites of CA1. And they provide a very weak excitation of the CA1 soma, um, in contrast to the Schaefer collaterals, which provide very strong excitation. And that weak excitation is largely due to their underprivileged status of um, happening at synapse on the very distal dendrites. And so their EPSPs are subject to a great deal of attenuation as they propagate to the soma. And as um, you've heard from others, that this basic excitatory circuit is also under the influence of a large number of inhibitory neurons. There's a diverse population of inhibitory neurons in the hippocampus. At least 20 different types of inhibitory neurons have been identified that can be classified according to their molecular markers, according to their morphology. And in this example, just showing you according to the location of their axons and the regions of the CA1 pyramidal neuron that they target. So we have a class of basket cells that target the soma and provide very strong inhibitory control on the output of CA1. And we also have a class of interneurons that target the dendrites and so influence the ability of certain classes of synaptic input, but perhaps not others, to excite the CA1 um, neuron. So we have this um, remarkable convergence of both macro excitatory circuits coming from different brain regions, as well as local micro inhibitory circuits, all controlling the um, ability of CA1 to generate action potentials. Now, a number of years ago, when Josh Dudman was in the lab, he became very curious as to why have both a direct input from entorhinal cortex, as well as this indirect input converging on the same neuron. Again, this is a very, the direct input is very weak. The indirect input is very strong. And when we, uh, you record from the soma and stimulate the direct input, you only produce an EPSP that's a millivolt or two. So it's not able to gener generate an action potential output. So Josh reasoned that, well, rather than having these inputs act as direct excitatory drives of CA1 output, maybe they can serve as instructive signals by interacting with the Schaefer collateral inputs to lead to some regulation of the efficacy of excitation 
through this excitatory Schaefer collateral pathway. And indeed, Josh found when he paired stimulation of the entorhinal cortex with the Schaefer collateral inputs, and this was all done in isolated hippocampal slice, at a low frequency for about um, a minute or a minute and a half, he was able to produce a very strong potentiation of the excitation by the Schaefer collateral pathway. And Josh termed this form of plasticity ITDP, ITDP or input timing dependent plasticity by analogy with spike timing dependent plasticity. And so um, in the years since Josh did his initial experiments, Joyda Basu then joined the lab and decided to look in more detail about the circuit that was able to implement some of the very interesting features of ITDP. And so I just want to summarize today some of the roles that uh, the circuits that she's identified within the hippocampus. She's found that one class of inhibitory neurons, the basket cells, play a, criti a critical role in the expression of ITDP by regulating ITDP, regulates the strength of this feed-forward inhibition. Um, and then she identified a second set of interneurons, these dendrite-targeting interneurons, that normally control the induction of ITDP by receiving powerful, uh, by <clears throat> promoting powerful feed-forward inhibition of the dendrites. They normally prevent the Schaefer collateral pathway from inducing ITDP. And finally, a third player is someone unexpectedly um, involves a long-range input from inhibitory neurons from entorhinal cortex that had been underappreciated. And these inhibitory interneurons selectively target these dendrite targeting interneurons. And so when we activate the entorhinal cortex inputs, we transiently inhibit this feed forward inhibition. And this leads to a disinhibitory relief of the circuit and enables us to induce ITDP. So that's just the general overview of what I want to tell you about some of the specific experiments that um, Joita and Josh have done over the past several years to work out the circuitry. And so to provide us with an example of how one can build inherent, inherent within the um, synaptic connectivity of the hippocampus, we have these local synaptic learning rules embedded within the circuitry. So it's not all Hebbian plasticity, we think, but there are also, within the complex circuitry, very specific um, mechanisms for controlling the activity of this particular circuit, and as we'll see, contributing to memory storage. So to look at the properties of ITDP, as I mentioned, what Josh did was he obtained a hippocampal slice, and he stimulated separately the Schaefer collateral inputs, as well as the entorhinal cortex inputs with two stimulating electrodes, and recorded the response within the cell body. And he measured the effect of pairing the entorhinal cortex and the Schaefer collateral inputs for about 90 seconds at one hertz. And he looked at the ability of that to influence both the Schaefer collateral EPSP, or uh, P synaptic potential, as well as the entorhinal cortex synaptic potential. And he did all of this with inhibition intact. And what Josh found, uh, somewhat surprisingly, was that he was able to produce a very large, long-lasting potentiation of the Schaefer collateral input, but not, no effect on the entorhinal cortex input by this pairing of these two pathways. And moreover, he found that the potentiation, which could be somewhere between two and a half to threefold, of this depolarization or the excitation of the CA1 pyramidal neuron was finely tuned to the pairing interval and was maximal when the entorhinal cortex input was stimulated exactly 20 milliseconds before the Schaefer collateral input. So he had to stimulate the entorhinal cortex input first. 20 milliseconds later, he stimulated the Schaefer collateral input, and he repeated that pairing at 1 hertz for 60 to 90 seconds stopped the pairing, and then just stimulated the Schaefer collateral pathway alone and saw this very pronounced potentiation of the ability of the Schaefer collateral input to depolarize the CA1 pyramidal neuron. And as I said, this is very finely tuned to this pairing interval. He saw very little potentiation at a 30 millisecond interval, a 10 millisecond interval when he reversed um, the pairing. There was no significant potentiation. And this um, 
potentiation had a number of similarity, uh, similar properties and differences with uh, regular old LTP. Unlike LTP, it was a heterosynaptic learning mechanism. The entorhinal cortex would, provided a teaching uh, role in stimulating the um, inducing plasticity at the Schaefer collateral inputs. It was produced by low frequency, weak subthreshold pairing, so the CA1 pyramidal neuron never fired an action potential. However, it also required activation of NMDA receptors. Um, it required calcium influx into the CA1 pyramidal neuron and the activation of MGLUR um, receptors. So we have this convergent activation of these two different pathways leading to this pronounced potentiation. And perhaps um, one of the interesting features is that this represents a non-Hebbian learning rule because we are re rewarding the Schaefer collateral inputs. We're potentiating the synaptic effect of these inputs, not for, generate, pre for predicting of action potential firing in the CA1 pyramidal neuron, but rather for being activated at the precise interval after the CA1 pyramidal neuron is depolarized by its entorhinal cortex inputs. And what's particularly interesting about this 20 millisecond interval is that it matches the predicted delay line architecture of the hippocampus because the trisynaptic pathway information arriving from, uh, arising from the entorhinal cortex has been shown to take about 20 milliseconds longer to propagate through the trisynaptic path than the direct path. And it's um, of interest, and perhaps coincidence or perhaps not, that this ITDP is induced precisely at this interval that we think matches the built-in delay line architecture of the hippocampus. So we think this is an interesting synaptic learning rule in addition to more typical Hebbian forms of synaptic plasticity. And the, um, at the end of Josh's experiments, there are really two open questions. One is, what is the nature of the synaptic changes that underlie the expression of ITDP? How can this very weak pairing of this pre and this postsynaptic cell produce such a large two and a half to threefold potentiation, which is often larger than the LTP you get with very strong titanic stimulation of the Schaefer collateral input. And then the second um, question was, what controls the precise timing dependence of ITDP? How is it tuned so exactly to this 20 millisecond interval? And in both cases, what I will tell you is that inhibition plays a key role in, um, in both of these properties. So um, one, um, the first question that we approached was what is the nature of the mechanism leading to the expression of ITDP. Now, because the Schaefer collateral input both directly excites the CA1 pyramidal neuron, but also excites these inhibitory basket cells, the net PSP that one measures is a sum of excitation and inhibition, overlapping excitation and inhibition. So the enhancement of the PSP after we induce ITDP, so this is an example experiment that Joita did, just showing the size of the Schaefer collateral evoked PSP, again, with inhibition intact, before and after ITDP. The potentiation, in principle, could be due either to the suppression of feed-forward inhibition and or the potentiation of excitation or a combination of the two. So to get at that question, what Joita did was dissect it out the amount of um, pure excitation from inhibition by blocking GABA receptors, GABA-A and GABA-B receptors, and measuring the size of the pure EPSP prior to the induction of ITDP. And by subtracting the pure EPSP from the net postsynaptic potential, which is the sum of the EPSP and the IPSP, the inhibitory response, Joita could derive the inferred size of the IPSP. So you can see that when we stimulate the Schaefer collateral pathway, there's a large EPSP that sums with a large IPSP to generate a net um, depolarizing synaptic response. Now, when she applied the GABA blockers after she induced ITDP, surprisingly, the GABA blockers had relatively little effect. And if she compared the pure EPSP in the presence of GABA blockers before and after the induction of ITDP, she can see there was about a 40% enhancement in the size of the pure excitatory response. And so the, what this tells us is that one component of ITDP, 
is due to the long-term potentiation of excitatory synaptic transmission, or ELTP. However, when she now measured the inferred IPSP, what she could see is after the induction of ITDP, there's a large reduction in the size of the inhibitory postsynaptic potential. And so the net effect, this large enhancement that we see in the postsynaptic potential is due to these synergistic effects of enhancing excitation and depressing inhibition. And Joita went on to identify the population of interneurons that were being regulated. They were a cholecystokinin expressing class of basket cells um, that act in parallel to the parvalbumin positive basket cells um, that Lindsay mentioned. Um, and what we see is that there, um, this effect is mediated, the suppression of this effect is mediated by the release of endocannabinoids from the pyramidal neuron that activates the CB1 type endocannabinoid receptor, which is known to suppress um, GABA release. So this we think is a, the mechanism underlying the expression of ITDP. So then this leaves the second question is what controls the precise timing dependence of ITDP? Why is it so tightly tuned to that 20 millisecond interval. So one clue to this came from an experiment that Joita did. This was a tuning curve, the typical tuning curve that she obtained with inhibition intact. And then she asked, does this precise timing depend on inhibitory neurons? Because in many cases, we know that in one of the roles of inhibition is to finally control the timing dependence of excitation. So Joita repeated the ITDP induction protocol, but now she blocked all inhibitory synaptic transmission only during the period of, of pairing the presynaptic and postsynaptic cell. And what she found was that when inhibition was blocked, only during this um, induction phase, she could still induce a very nice ITDP. If anything, it was a little larger. We got a threefold potentiation. But now this very precise timing dependence was lost. 30 millisecond, 10 millisecond delay produced about the same amount of potentiation as we saw with the 20 millisecond delay. So this very tight tuning curve clearly depended on inhibition. So how can we explain the the effect of inhibition to tighten up the timing dependence of ITDP. So in order to try and explore this question, what Joita did was she performed experiments where she, instead of recording from the soma, she decided to record from the dendrite of the CA1 pyramidal neuron, the site of um, presumed integration of the EPSP from the enterinal cortex in the Schaefer collateral, and perhaps the site at which an inhibitory neuron could exert its influence. And what she found was that when she stimulated the enterinal cortex input alone and recorded from the uh, dendrite, she, in this case, in this particular cell, there was only a very small net depolarizing response, um, even when she recorded from the dendrite. When she recorded from the Schaefer collateral pathway alone, when she stimulated the Schaefer collateral rather alone, she recorded a nice large EPSP in the dendrite. And now, when she paired the two of them together, well, first of all, if they were just summating linearly, because the EPSP induced by the enterinal cortex was so small, linear summation would just give a very small boosting. But when she actually um, activated the Schaefer collaterals 20 milliseconds after stimulating the enterinal cortex, she saw that there was about a 40% boosting in the size of the net synaptic depolarization when she paired the two. So this was telling us that there was some superlinear interaction going on when she stimulated these two pathways together. She then went on to show that this superlinear effect um, depended on exactly, uh, was maximal at this 20 millisecond interval. When she paired the enterinal cortex with the Schaefer collateral stimulation at the other intervals, the, some, uh, the EPSP was much less than it was with the 20 millisecond um, pairing, and mostly it was either linear or superlinear, uh, sublinear, the, the summation. Now, when she blocked inhibition, interestingly, well, first of all, the EPSPs got larger because now the underlying feed forward inhibition is gone, but when she looked at the effect of pairing the enterinal cortical stimulation with the Schaefer collateral stimulation and compared the predictions of a linear sum 
of the EPSP. Now you can see the EPSP to the Schaefer collateral um, is down here. Uh, I'm sorry, to the enterocortical cortex. This is the enterocortical cortex EPSP. On top of that, riding on top of that, is the Schaefer collateral EPSP. Now the um, paired activation produced only linear or sublinear summation. We no longer got that superlinear boosting when inhibition was blocked. And moreover, the peak response now occurred at 10 milliseconds rather than 20 milliseconds. And actually, that 10 milliseconds is what one would predict just by the summation, the passive summation of the enterocortical cortex EPSP and the Schaefer collateral EPSP. So somehow, inhibition was doing something special. Even though inhibition is suppressing the EPSP, somehow inhibition was required for this superlinear summation. So how can we explain that? How can we explain that having inhibition there gives us more summation than we would predict? And there's actually a um, fairly simple model, of, uh, <clears throat> which I mentioned at the beginning of the talk, this idea that the Schaefer, <clears throat> that there is a disinhibitory effect on um, feed forward inhibition when we stimulate the enterocortical cortex pathway. So the idea is that there is a class of interneurons, it's a well-known class of interneurons, that sit at the border of stratum radiatum and stratum lacanosum moleculare, out at the, um, the border where the enterocortical cortex inputs come in and where the Schaefer collateral inputs end. And these uh, interneurons are known to receive strong excitation by the Schaefer collateral inputs and they're also excited by the enterocortical cortex inputs. So what we imagine is that every time we stimulate the Schaefer collateral inputs and record from the CA1 pyramidal neuron, um, there is a mixed EPSP in the dendrites as well as an IPSP in the a dendritic IPSP due to this class of um, stratum radiatum, stratum lacanosum moleculare interneurons. And so the net depolarization is much less than the pure EPSP because of this opposing inhibition. And all of this is going out in the, is happening out in the dendrites and independent from the other class of basket cells that were innervating the soma. So we predict that there is a large feed forward inhibition that's limiting the ability of the Schaefer collaterals to activate the dendrites. Now we imagine that there are these long range inhibitory projections which had been identified by Hannah Monnier's lab that come enter the hippocampus from the enterocortical cortex, and they're known to selectively target interneurons out at this boundary zone. And so what we presume is that when we stimulate the enterocortical cortex pathway, we activate both the excitatory inputs that generate an EPSP in the pyramidal neuron, may help to excite this interneuron, but at the same time, we activate these long-range inhibitory projections, and we induce an IPSP in these um, interneurons. So if we were to first stimulate the enterocortical cortex pathway and then stimulate the Schaefer collaterals soon after, if the interneurons are inhibited by these long-range projections, then this ability of the Schaefer collaterals to activate these interneurons will be reduced, and the IPSP um, that these interneurons produce in the CA1 pyramidal neuron will be um, decreased, and as a result, the net depolarization will be increased. And so what, this is what we think underlies the superlinear summation between the activation of the, of the enterocortical cortex pathway and the Schaefer collateral pathway. It's not that anything that's happening within the pyramidal neuron itself, it's not that we're firing a dendritic spike, but rather it's simply that they, um, we are inhibiting this local class of inhibitory interneurons, and so we are revealing a larger EPSP, a larger depolarizing response. So that's the model, and how can we test that? Well, um, what Joyita did was to perform patch clamp recordings from this class of interneurons, and then to stimulate the enterocortical cortex inputs and the Schaefer collateral input, and to measure the synaptic response. And we st when she stimulated the Schaefer collateral inputs and recorded from these interneurons, she saw there was a large EPSP that often was able to fire an action potential 
in these interneurons. Now, when she stimulated the entorhinal cortex inputs, she saw something interesting. She saw that there was an initial EPSP, which was rapidly fo um, followed by a large IPSP. And the peak of the IPSP occurred 20 milliseconds after the um, start of the stimulation. So the, this interneuron, in fact, was indeed being maximally inhibited just at the time at which the Schaefer collateral response was being boosted um, by the stimulation of the entorhinal cortex inputs. So finally, um, this IPSP is possibly due to these long-range inhibitory projections, but it also could be that these pyramidal neuron axons uh, coming from the entorhinal cortex were exciting another class of interneurons that selectively targeted interneurons. So these are the two possible explanations for this IPSP that we record in the interneuron. And to distinguish between them, what Joeda did was she applied blockers of glutamate receptors to block the ability of the entorhinal cortex inputs to excite a local interneuron, but this should leave um, direct inhibition intact. And in fact, when Joeda blocked all excitation and stimulated the entorhinal cortex inputs, she still, she was able to block the EPSP in these interneurons and reveal um, intact this large IPSP. So indeed, whenever we stimulate, put our stimulating out electrode <clears throat> out in the distal dendrites, we are both producing an, IP, an EPSP in the pyramidal neuron, but perhaps even more importantly, we're producing a powerful IPSP in this class of dendrite targeting interneurons and thereby suppressing the ability of the Schaefer collateral inputs to activate these, um, these interneurons. So the next question that Joyita asked was, well, are the, is this inhibition really coming from these long-range inhibitory projections from entorhinal cortex? So to get at that question, what she did was to express channel rhodopsin in the entorhinal cortex in a GAD2 Cree line of mice that expressed Cree recombinase selectively in interneurons, and she used a Cree-dependent virus to only express channel rhodopsin in interneurons, uh, inhibitory neurons, in the entorhinal cortex. And then she obtained a hippocampal slice and used light to activate the channel rhodopsin in the, any um, inhibitory projections that might be coming to um, hippocampus. And what she found was that when she expressed channel rhodopsin in medi either medial entorhinal cortex, which provides mostly spatial information to hippocampus, or lateral entorhinal cortex, which provides non-spatial information, and recorded the inhibitory postsynaptic current under voltage clamp from this, these interneurons, these border interneurons, she saw that indeed the activation of these long-range projections was able to induce a very large inhibitory um, outward current that was blocked by um, blockers of GABA A and GABA B receptors, but was unaffected by blockers of excitatory transmission. So in fact, this was a direct inhibitory projection coming from the entorhinal cortex, and predominantly, <clears throat> it was lateral entorhinal cortex that was inducing the largest inhibitory response, although medial entorhinal cortex also sent projections into the hippocampus. So this then led us to ask, well, what is the functional role of these inhibitory inputs in that synaptic boosting that we saw when we paired the perforin path activation with the Schaefer collateral activation. So do these long-range projections really mediate that superlinear summation? Because remember, according to our model, whenever we stimulate the entorhinal cortex pathway with our electrical stimulation, the major effect that we think we're doing to boost the signal is to transiently inhibit this population of interneurons. So to test that idea, Joita expressed a pharmacogenetic um, <clears throat> agent this, uh, that was developed by Scott Sternson at Genelia Farm. He calls this a PSAM glycine receptor. It's an engineered glycine receptor that is activated by a cognate ligand called PSAM selectively. And so she expressed this PSAM glycine receptor in inhibitory neurons in entorhinal cortex and then gave paired stimulation of the entorhinal cortex and Schaefer collateral um, inputs, just as before. And you can see, again, she saw this superlinear summation 
peaked at the 20 millisecond interval. And now when she inactivated, when she silenced these inputs with this, whoops, with the PSAM ligand, she completely blocked the superlinear summation. And now the Schaefer collateral and entorhinal cortex pathways just showed normal linear or sublinear summation. So indeed, suggesting that, these, um, uh, that this disinhibition model was correct. So finally, um, Joeda looked at um, ITDP itself and said, do we really need these inputs to induce this ITDP when we pair the um, entorhinal cortex and Schaefer collateral inputs? And this is just the normal time course of ITDP that one typically sees when we pair the entorhinal cortex and Schaefer collateral inputs, this potential threefold, two and a half to threefold potentiation lasting 40 minutes. And when she silenced these inputs, um, <clears throat> these long range inhibitory inputs, she completely blocked the ability to induce ITDP, presumably because these um, interneurons now were no longer being suppressed by these inhibitory inputs from entorhinal cortex. So we were getting a constitutive inhibition of the dendrites every time we stimulated the Schaefer collateral inputs. So, so far, we've been looking at the role of these inputs in isolated slices. And the question then is, what is its physiological relevance? Under what conditions might these inputs be activated under in vivo conditions? And so here, Joita teamed up with Jeff Zaremba and Attila Lasanchi's lab, and the two of them decided to express GCAMP6 in the inhibitory neurons in entorhinal cortex, and then use in vivo two-photon microscopy to image the axons of these um, inhibitory projections from entorhinal cortex in the CA1 region of the hippocampus. And what, um, <clears throat> what um, this, the setup that they used was a mouse that was running on a um, on a treadmill with various textures, and they were able to apply various sensory stimuli, a noxious air puff to the eye of the uh, mouse, a water reward, tone or light, or in various combinations. And this is just an example of what um, one of these axon inhibitory projections looks like um, in the two-photon microscope. And just as um, Lindsay had described, we had um, imaged, uh, Jaida and Jeff had imaged activity in individual boutons along one axon or along multiple axons. And this is just an example of a calcium response um, to, a, to an air puff. And so using this technique, um, Joida and Jeff were able to image a large number of boutons. And what they found was that air puff elicited the largest mean calcium response, but only about 20 to 25% of these long-range inhibitory projections of the Bouton showed any response, and the response was somewhat variable in its amplitude. When they gave a water reward, somewhat uh, small, it evoked a somewhat smaller mean response. There was a somewhat smaller fraction of Boutons that responded. And then when they invoked tones or light, the mean response was even smaller and the fractional of Boutons that responded were smaller. And interestingly, the, the Boutons that responded to one stimuli tended not to respond to another. So they seem to be largely overlap, um, independent population of Boutons, each of them conveying to the hippocampus this inhibitory input from entorhinal cortex in response to these various stimuli. And so finally, the um, one question was, to, do these inputs have any behavioral relevance? They um, convey information about um, sensory signals in the environment. They convey information about potential punishments and reward. And so what um, Joida and Fred Hitty in the lab did was they asked whether or not these inputs were necessary for a simple form of hippocampal dependent learning and memory contextual fear conditioning. So what they did was they expressed, again, this PSAM glycine receptor in inhibitory neurons in entorhinal cortex. And then they used a cannula to locally deliver the PSAM ligand not to entorhinal cortex, but to hippocampus. And in this way, they attempted to only silence the projections from entorhinal cortex and not silence the um, cell bodies or any projections that these neuro inhibitory neurons might make locally within entorhinal cortex. 
And so the um, <coughs> protocol that they used was to, on day one, they exposed a mouse um, into a chamber with various sensory cues, um, olfactory and visual and tactile sensory cues. This was a freely moving mouse. Um, they then applied a tone for 30 seconds. And at the end of the tone, they gave the mouse a shock for two seconds. And they left the mouse in the chamber for another 30 seconds. And on day one, on, during this training day, the mouse uh, fear behavior was assessed by the percent of time that the mouse spent freezing. And the mouse uh, basically showed little freezing um, prior to the shock. And even after the shock on day one, the freezing wasn't um, that great. And then to assess memory on day two, they re-exposed the mouse to the same environment in which it had received the shock. And what they found was that in both the control group and the group that had been expressing PSAM, both groups were treated with the PSAM ligand. Um, but the groups, um, both groups showed a learning, clear learning de um, depicted by this enhanced freezing. Now, the interesting thing occurred on day three when they exposed the mouse to a completely novel context. Now, most mice, including the control mice, recognize this as a neutral context. They distinguish it from the context in which they were shocked, and they show no freezing. However, the group in which these long-range inhibitory projections had been inactivated during the training trial, during exposure to the envi training environment and the shock on day one, now showed an inappropriately high level of freezing. So they seemed to generalize their fear response both to the context in which they were shocked, but importantly to the context in which they were not shocked. Now, this wasn't just a general increase in anxiety, because um, on day three, Joita then exposed the mice to the tone, and the tone elicits a hippocampal independent fear response mediated by the amygdala, and um, nothing was manipulated in the amygdala in these experiments, and both mice showed a normal freezing response to the tone. So there was no difference then in the response of the mice, um, of either group of mice, suggesting that these long-range inhibitory projections may not be necessary for basic memory formation, but they may be important for um, memory ensuring memory specificity. So uh, finally, um, just in the last slide, um, it's some recent experiments that Felix Leroy has been doing. We've been focusing on CA1, and one question is, is ITDP specific for CA1, or might this be a generalized learning rule? CA2 is a neighboring region to CA1. It also receives direct input from entorhinal cortex and input through the trisynaptic path from the upstream CA3 region. And our lab and others have recently shown that CA2 is critical for social memory. So Felix began by doing some experiments, pairing um, stimulation of the entorhinal cortex and Schaefer collateral inputs at this 20 millisecond interval. And indeed, he found he could produce a powerful potentiation of the Schaefer collateral inputs with um, a small but significant effect also, in this case, on the perforin path inputs. This also involved a powerful suppression of feed forward inhibition. And it was also selectively tuned to this 20 millisecond pairing interval, although he saw, uh, Felix saw somewhat greater responses at these other intervals than what we saw in CA1. Now, interestingly, the Although we see the same type of synaptic learning rule with the same timing dependence, the nature of the loss of inhibition is completely different. It's a different class of interneurons. It's the parvalbumin positive basket cells that are being decreased in, the, in CA2. And it does not involve endocannabinoids, but involves activation of delta opioid receptors. So this suggests that this ITDP may provide this timing dependence, may represent a substantial, um, a substantially important mechanism for regulating the strength of synaptic <clears throat> transmission, although the molecular mechanism may be tuned differentially to the local um, in environment, the, the cellular and the, um, the local circuitry that a particular neuron is, happens to be in. So then um, I think what, what I've tried to ex um, get across today is that when we want to think about how the hippocampus or any circuit works, how it forms memories, how it processes information, 
we have to think both about the long range excitatory inputs that are coming into the region. We have to think about how those inputs are differentially targeted to different regions of the dendritic tree and how that differentially targeting may be manipulated by the cell to produce interesting computations. In this case, we think that CA1 is producing a computation in collaboration with its local inhibitory circuitry to selectively amplify inputs that are coming in through the trisynaptic path based on their relevance, on their salience, uh, which is assessed by the timing delay, whether or not they have that proper 20 millisecond timing delay indicating that these two pathways may be uh, bringing in uh, complementary or um, convergent information onto the, onto the pathway. We've also found that these long-range inhibitory projections provide a, a key critical role in enabling this induction of plasticity, and they gate the information coming in through the trisynaptic path. A single stimulus to these long-range projections produces a transient gating tied to that 20 millisecond IPSP. Repeated activation of these long-range inputs in the entorhinal cortex, excitatory inputs, with the Schaefer collateral inputs leads to a long-range gating of the Schaefer collateral inputs by producing a long-term suppression of this feed-forward inhibition from these inhibitory basket cells. So in this way, I think we, we can see how circuits can be designed to act in a very coordinated fashion. And I think in terms of what I really want to understand in the future from this is why. What is it about this convergence of this direct information coming onto the distal dendrites and this processed information, which probably contains mnemonic information stored in dentate and CA3. What is the nature of that comparison? And really, what is it doing for the circuitry? So finally, let me just acknowledge all the uh, wonderful collaborators I've had. Joy Basu um, just uh, is now an assistant professor at NYU. Um, Stephanie Chung is um, going to medical school. Fred Hitty is a neurosurgeon at Penn. Um, Felix Leroy um, and David Brown are both in the lab now. Josh Dudman started this all a number of years ago with David Tsai. And we were grateful. Um, we had a wonderful collaboration on the imaging with Attila and Jeff Saremba. Boris Zemmelman gave us some uh, advice and help with viruses and some others. And I thank you for your attention and for staying awake for the whole day.